You're listening to Sustainably Geeky, the podcast for everyday environmentalists. Hi, you're listening to Sustainably Geeky, episode 66. Today, I'm very excited to be talking to Don Hartzell, JD, founder and first commissioner for the World Air League. The World Air League is actively engaged in developing, incubating, sustainable green lighter than air aviation with the focus on reducing, eliminating the use of fossil fuels for aviation commerce. Uh, through this work, he is organizing the World Sky Race, the historic first race of airships to circle the planet. And Don is an advocate for sustainable paths using lighter than air or LTA airship advanced aviation technology. So Don, welcome to the show. And would you mind just starting by telling us how you got into this field and what brought you to, to found the World Air League? Well, Jennifer, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, It's a pleasure to uh, meet you uh, in this electronic world that we have, knowing that you're in Ireland and I'm in Texas today. And so uh, a little bit about what we are doing and why we're doing it. Uh, We formed the World Air League to basically create a race of airships around the world. And that was our original idea. But out of that, what we have found is the idea has grown and it has evolved. And in putting together uh, the connecting these dots, the dots necessary to create the world sky race around the world, what we found is that we needed to have causes beyond just simply having fun. We had to develop a rationale since we're adults on why we want to play with big balloons. And so... Our goal in this is evolved, and as it has evolved, it's become a cause and a mission. And in so doing, we have found our true calling in life, and that is the organizing, the promotion, the incubation of technology, green, sustainable aviation technology, such that its impact will be more than just simply fun. It will actually be profound, profound in the sense that what we will see coming out of this race will be green aviation. It is our goal to take what is just the simple physics of buoyancy. In other words, simple science. And it's the simplest of sciences that we see that produces perhaps those most profound results. And so we are looking at buoyancy lighter than air. And lighter than air means exactly that. You float in the air. You spend no energy to get in the air. As a result of spending no energy in the air, lighter than air ships are already by default the greenest form of aviation. To emphasize that, to move a pound per mile or a kilogram per kilometer, as far as the energy expenditure is concerned as in comparing with an airplane, a gas guzzling airplane, versus a lighter than air ship, uh, to move that pound per mile or that kilogram per kilometer takes 75% less energy. That means 75% less fuel. That means 75% less pollution. That means 75% less cost. So that's the greenest form of aviation if you are looking at the normal propulsion systems in airships as they are today which they just use aviation fuel. So they are going to have a carbon footprint, yes, but it is our goal is to take the combination of technology, the combination of lighter than air engineering, which has been around for an entire century and combine it with today's urgent needs for a pathway of green aviation. So what we're looking at doing with our World Sky Race is challenging inventors to invent, investors to invest, and adventurers to compete. And they will compete in airships that do not have as their energy source fossil fuel. So we're going to go to hydrogen. We're going to go to electric battery. We'll go to solar power. We'll go to synthetic fuels. But we will not have our competitors use conventional fossil fuel. So we're going to take the greenest form of aviation and make it greener. And so there is why we're doing it. It's the mission that we're that is beyond fund. It is a mission designed to move 
the world forward with what we would describe as obvious. And this is literally the power of obvious. Well, that's very exciting. And I am uh, very interested in, you know, learning more about what you guys do and just, you know, how, I guess this is gonna gonna happen. Um, wh what is the intended route and time frame for this race? All right, we're looking at creating a race that connects the world. I like calling it connecting the dots. And so we're going to start this race at the Greenwich Prime Meridian in front of the atomic clock where all time on earth is synchronized. So the first three hours of this race is we're going to race around the landscape of London. That means taking the H9 helicopter path right down the Thames. We're going to go over the O2 Dome. We're going to go past uh, London Tower, uh, Tower Bridge. We'll see the Millennium Eye, Houses of Parliament, Big Ben, as we race around London. This will be a televised broadcast. And so as we do this, We'll be showcasing the landscape and just the scenery of London. And I have to say this, uh, we're going to have an audience on the first two to three hours of our race that exceeded the entire audience of the London Olympics. Everyone who came to London to watch those Olympics, uh, London, they sold like eight and a half million tickets for all the days of the Olympics that were there. Well, we're going to beat eight and a half million viewers just in a few hours. So that's the first race. And so I'm going to describe the World Sky Race as it has evolved. It's going to be a series of races where we will take our flying circus. And two weeks later, we will be racing around Berlin. And two weeks after that, we'll be racing around the Roman Colosseum. But before we go beyond Berlin, I'm going to describe, in essence, the importance of our race route and its calendar. And that is, we will be taking off in London. Our race will be somewhere around World Tourism Day, as designated by the United Nations. When we're in Berlin, we're going to be flying over Germany on October 3rd. And if we were to translate that into American, I said July 4th. And so on October 3rd, it's German Unification Day. And so we will have the commanding performance on Germany's October 3rd with our airship race around Berlin. And this is a moment of exaltation in that the Germans, they are the center of airship development. It was originally uh, Count von Zeppelin in southern Germany, Friedrichshaven, who developed uh, the original Zeppelins. And so we are going to be, in essence, making our homage to Germany for its creation of the greenest form of aviation. And so this is culturally something that Germans love. It is an area where they come together in their just absolute adulation of airships. So uh, our calendar is replete with moments where we are celebrating where we are. So on our way to uh, uh, Rome, two weeks after our, our October 3rd uh, race around Berlin, we will be in Rome. And on our way to Rome, we'll be flying over places like Monaco, where Prince Albert of Monaco is a great uh, friend of the World Sky Race. And uh, Monaco, in many, many elements of history, played significant roles in the development of airships. And so we will be, in essence, having our homage to our friends in Monaco. And in that, we will be picking up commemorative air stamps issued by Monaco on behalf of the World Sky Race. So we're going to have, besides profound moments, we're going to have fun as well. And so we'll go to Rome, and in Rome we'll race around 
oh golly i mean you know think of all the architecture that is in rome and just how glorious that two to three hour race around rome is going to be from there onward we go to and get to land right next to the great pyramids in egypt and so this is going to be a race where as we connect the dots these are big dots we're talking about and so uh, as we go forward, we're looking at Petra, we're looking at a city to be determined in the Middle East, the Taj Mahal, the Twin Towers of Malaysia, Halong Bay outside of Hanoi, those glorious pillars of, of just fantastic towering rocks in the ocean that are just absolutely, I mean, they're just fantastic to see and to have that as part of our tapestry. Then it's onward to the Chinas and then there to Kyoto. And we'll take the uh, land bridge, if you will, the uh, Bering uh, Sea, the Aleutian Isles will be our safety net for crossing the uh, Pacific Northwest to Anchorage. Coming down the coastline of North America, we will go to San Francisco, Moffett Field, we'll uh, take in places like San Diego, and then we'll be coming here to Texas, where I live. And then from Texas, we'll go to the Statue of Liberty. And the Portuguese, as part of their involvement in this race, they have offered two frigates of the Vasco da Gama class that have helicopter decks to be our safety net for crossing the Atlantic Ocean. So we'll go from New York to Lisbon, and then we will have our final dash where we go to Paris. And at Versailles Palace is where we will end this race. And Versailles Palace happens to be where the Montgolfier brothers launched the very first hot air balloon. In other words, mankind's first step into the heavens, that first moment where we became that airborne species, no longer you know, just simply watching birds, but becoming airborne ourselves. We're going to end where it began. Well, you've definitely put a lot of thought into not only um, like the scenic route, but the cultural importance of the places you're going. And I'm just wondering, like, how do you get a ticket on one of these? Because it sounds awesome. And I'd, <laughs> I think everybody's going to be like, wow, I want to be on that. Obviously, you probably have to have your own airship, but <laughs> definitely sounds like a fun time. Um, so, so overall, like how how long is that time frame? From start We're to finish. looking at roughly a uh, seven-month period. Okay. Um, yeah, essentially September to May. And we've planned additionally our route to be more than just simply a fun route of airships going around the world. We want to make an impact. Mm -hmm. And that impact is going to be with our educational partners. And so this race is going to start in September. And the 17 races, when we complete with them, they will be completed in May. And mm -hmm. this is on purpose. This is also defined, as the world knows it, as a school year. And so with our educational partners, we're going to have available on the Internet the daily lesson plans. So teachers can download the daily lesson plans and then walk into their classrooms and ask that very fun question, where are the airships today? And with that, they can talk about geography, science, culture, history, math. And so this becomes that fun discussion, that educational discussion. It's also going to be a shared experience for the world's next generation, for all those who tune in and become a part of this and use this as a means to get connected. We're talking about really connecting the dots. And in this regards, what we want this race to be is something that teachers use effectively to create that renewable energy in their classrooms, that renewable energy called fun. And with that, we see a shared bond, a shared educational experience created and so when we talk about bonds, we're also talking about dividends and dividends and investments. And this is an investment in the future that will pay dividends for decades. And so it is our goal with this shared experience 
while the next generation is in their classrooms studying the same materials at the same time and getting connected and seeing the smiles and the laughter of the children and the students that are on our race route as they connect in this educational experience, we're going to be delivering to the world an experience that's going to be a part of the next generation while it's forming its mission in life. So we will end up being a part of that. And so I just took this race from a really fun idea to something that does connect us all. Yeah, definitely sounds like something that'll have a big impact on kids and adults alike. And um, especially the ones, you know, in the, the line of the route where they can physically see it. But yeah, it's, either way, you know, it's, it's going to be huge. So um, you've kind of touched on this already, but can you tell us what is an airship? A lot of people probably picture an airship and think of something out of a sci-fi movie or something. And, and I know they've been around a long time, but can you go over kind of a brief history of, you know, what they did and how they've changed over the years? All right. Well, you know, airships are a fascinating subject and uh, they, the genesis uh, for airships was putting motors on balloons and trying to figure out how that combination of technology could occur. And so the development of airships started back in the 1880s and uh, resulted in the first airships, true airships, being developed by Count von Zeppelin uh, at the beginning of uh, the uh, 19th, you know, in the 1900s. And what they were doing was taking the structure of lighter than air, something uh, that would either a envelope that could hold helium or hold uh, hydrogen and putting motors and fins on it and making it a navigable uh, device or navigable vessel. That's probably the better term or better way to describe it. And so airships at the beginning of the 1900s was in a competition with the development of yet a different form of technology called the airplane. And airships in the beginning uh, were basically uh, putting the airplane uh, in a competition where that airplane, its engine had to get more compact and develop more horsepower to be effective, whereas airships were effective to begin with. They just needed to be designed to be effective. And so airships became literally the first airline, the first international airline between Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, and then expanding beyond that to be the first intercontinental airline of scheduled services between Europe, North America, and South America. And, in the, and they were doing this at a time when airplanes were struggling to get just simply across the Atlantic. Uh, basically dealing with, you know, four to five passengers on board an airplane to do a mail route, whereas in airships, they were traveling with 180 passengers and crew. And so there was a significant competition between what airships could do and deliver versus the airplane. But the airplane won that phase of the technology race. They won it simply because airships were fundamentally uh, labor intensive. Uh, and, and I'll give you probably the best way to appreciate that is an airship while it's traveling, it's burning its fuel. As it burns its fuel, it's getting lighter. And as it gets lighter, that gigantic balloon that it is uh, becomes more difficult to manage at landing. And so an airship, in order to land, would require a small army of about 250 burly people to hold that balloon down to keep it from floating away before they could put ballast on it to keep it weighted down. Well, they needed an equivalent number of people on hand to launch it. And so by comparison, airplanes at the time, they could fly with just simply a pilot. They didn't have that many control towers at the time. You know, they had airfields where, you know, a plane would arrive and land or take off. And so the intensity of the labor 
is why airships in the 1930s went out of vogue. Uh, and so most people think of it as that fiery crash, the Hindenburg, the one that is indelibly in the world's uh, knowledge of airships, uh, that crash. But there was more a fundamental reason as to why the airplane at that time won the technology race. And so what we are doing is taking these engineering proofs that existed in the 1930s when airships were flying over the Arctic, over the North Pole, doing intercontinental trans, uh, transatlantic, transpacific flights. Uh, we are looking at taking that technology, which already exists, and combining it with today's green technology. And so the competition between airships and airplanes is not over. What we're looking at is what was once said the golden age of airships was the 1920s, the 1930s. We look at the golden age of airships as going to be this century. It is because of the need that we all have. And you mentioned science fiction. Uh, if you look at science fiction novels and look at a preponderance of their covers for the last century, you will invariably see. We have been thinking about airships because airships are on their covers. And so this is not a novel uh, thought at all. In fact, it is the beginning of what we have all been expecting that we will realize. Yeah, I actually uh, recently, I guess, developed this concept of, of airships as a more commercial form of travel myself through a Cli-Fi book by Kim Stanley Robinson, where he um, uses airships as one of the main ways that we transition um, to, you know, a greener world. And and I was very intrigued by that. And, you know, that's how I kind of went down this rabbit hole of learning more about it. Um, so, so how have we, you know, how, how has the industry, I guess, addressed these issues? I mean, does it still take 250 people to launch and land these things? I, I would think that's probably not very practical uh, in this day and age. Plus, if you're trying to do a race like this, um, there's got to be a, a fix for that now, right? <laughs> there is. There, I mean, first of all, we, we've made massive improvements since the 1930s. And I'll, I'll go back to the 1930s for just a moment because this is illustrative of change. And that is in the 20s and the 30s, the only material that was commercially available for holding gas like hydrogen or helium in it with the least amount of leakage was essentially cow stomachs. And so the Hindenburg was constructed out of 30,000 cow stomachs. And so this is where I get to ask the question, haven't we improved since then? And so yeah. <laughs> in more ways than that, have we improved? And so we've developed a means to have the what's called vector thrust. In other words, you can rotate an engine that is on an aircraft. And with that engine rotation, airships can now uh, launch in a near vertical or land in a near vertical position. And that eliminates the ground crews that had to accompany them. And with that ability to control airflow, we now have a means where an airship can land with as few of people, if not fewer, than what you would see for any commercial aircraft today. And when you start thinking about how many people are involved on the ground from the people that have the little red uh, you know, flashlights that are pulling them in to those who work on the gate, you know, we're now talking about no dissimilarities. And so in that regards, you know, airships are as fundamentally uh, labor unintensive as an airplane, if not more. And so we've also had significant improvements in a variety of other areas beyond just simply, you know, labor intensity. And that is with the capabilities that we have for micro weather management, airships are now able to be more like those surfers in the sky taking advantage of weather waves to enhance their improvement and at the same time be able to deal with what 
whatever is coming their way in a more progressive and a more fundamentally important means of maneuvering. And so uh, set airships become, in essence, the gigantic sailboats of the sky. And, uh, and so in doing, you know, again, we're taking advantage of energy efficiencies. We're taking advantage of what nature provides to enable this technology to move forward. And, and the, that's just simply what it means to us in the air. But what it means to us on the ground is actually far, far more interesting. And uh, every government in the world, they have to make investments in what we call right away. Anything that gets in a government's right away is going to be destroyed or constructed upon simply to build another highway, another bridge, dredge another harbor, or destroy more tundra for basically railways, or, you know, that connective road between villages in the rainforest, they're going to tear down that rainforest. The wonderful thing about an airship is it doesn't need a road. It doesn't need a railroad. It does not need a harbor. It does not need a runway. And so the investments that governments make in the infrastructure grid that straddles our entire world of commerce and movement of people with an airship, this reduces the need for our dependency on the expansion of that grid. So going forward, what we're talking about is leaving alone those pristine areas that normally would get in a government's right of way. So less construction and maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, did I understand you correctly in your explanation that airships can basically weather the storm, for, for lack of a better term, um, better than airplanes in some in some ways? Like they can they can function in conditions that maybe airplanes can't fly in, or is that well, what you were trying to say there? Or? Essentially, so. And, okay. and I'll, I'll give you some examples that are historical. Uh, the United States airship. Uh, which was part of our Navy, uh, they patrolled our coast, you know, our uh, East Coast, our West Coast, and our Arctic Coast uh, back during the Cold War. They were looking for Russian submarines and trying to make certain that uh, they did not penetrate our territorial waters or stayed away from us. And so the history of airships is that the United States Navy operated airships in the Arctic. 330 days out of the year. And there's something that is not necessarily obvious to uh, a person that does not, that this is a first time subject for. And that is cold, dense air, in other words, Arctic air. It being colder, denser, an airship in it is far more buoyant and far more capable in those conditions than any others. But that's not to say that they're poor in the equatorial regions either. So airships are able to encompass the entirety of the world in terms of its geography. There's places that you don't wanna go over mountains with them, but you know there's always mountain passes. And in that regards, where we see the value of airships, is its universal ability to reach virtually any point on the planet. Very cool. Does the US military or any other military that you know of still use airships or have they all kind of been phased out? Well, wasn't there a recent uh, Chinese balloon <laughs> over the I United States? I actually thought States? of that as you were talking, yeah. <laughs> and so, so yeah, I guess uh, they, yeah. Yes, I mean, and, and we use airships here in the United States for border patrol uh, as well. Uh, basically, uh, it's a bird's eye view of uh, a, a significant horizon. And on top of that, airships represent in the world where they evolve again, a great way of restoring immediately communication systems in disaster areas. And so what we're looking at is 
how airships can be deployed usefully, one, from a security point of view, two, from a communications point of view, three, from a disaster response point of view. And so if there is an area that has been completely devastated by a hurricane, quite often the ports are inoperable for hours, if not days. Airships could immediately start arriving with filled hospitals and supplies as a means of alleviating the misery of such disasters. And so we're looking at the ability to marshal our resources far, far more effectively as we move towards the development of this technology for this century. Yeah, sounds very flexible and, and adaptable. So, um well, well, that's exciting. Um, I, f from a consumer's point of view, I'm curious, you know, what would commercial airship travel look like today? So I know you mentioned in the past um, <clears throat> it, it was done a little bit on a smaller scale, but in terms of comfort, safety, time and things like that, that people have come to expect, you know, I mean, flying via air can be quite a hassle and lots of red tape and time, but there's also certain comforts people come to expect. So, so how does how would that look? Um, are they able to match or exceed some of those experiences? Right now, what we're seeing is an evolutionary thought by airlines regarding airships. Uh, British Airways has just recently entered into a partnership with a uh, aviation company servicing the Mediterranean. They're going to be supplying for that service, roughly 10 airships, each able to move about 100 uh, passengers. And essentially, they're going to be connecting the dots in the Mediterranean, those including the islands like Mallorca and uh, you know Sicily and, and others as well. And so this is going to be regional flights, but part of what is so uh, enticing about this service is it's also providing that grand experience of being able to fly through these coastal regions with these fantastic gallery windows and the experience being quite unique. Uh, and so we're looking at this being a stimulus for tourism, tourism with an experience, a tourism with a grand feeling, and a tourism with, in essence, the luxury of time. Now, airships are not going to compete against uh, airplanes when it comes to time. And so if you've got to be there immediately, uh, that's where you're going to take the airplane. You're going to take that jet. But if you are wanting to cultivate your personal time and, in essence, enjoy the journey, there is where an airship becomes at its best. But when you think about it also, let's say you're able to do a sightseeing tour of Cairo from an airship. That is tourism without touching, without having to basically go and wear and tear the uh, monuments. Instead, you're getting that grand view, that simple uh, joy of what it looks like from such a wonderful moment. And I have to describe a personal experience. And that is, I'm on board a uh, the Sanyo Blimp uh, in San Diego. And there we are. We're going across the Pacific Ocean. We're coming out of the harbor there in San Diego. And the pilot brings the airship down to 15 feet above the cresting waves of the Pacific Ocean. And so there we are. We're following the wave line along the coast. The surfers that are in the Pacific Ocean, the beachgoers in the Pacific Ocean, everyone is jumping up and down and waving at us. And we're creating a moment of joy for them as we are doing this. And so as we're cruising along, this coastline, the pilot turns off the engine such that we're gliding and we're just listening to the crashing surf below us. And as we do that, he turned up the jazz. So it really is a higher quality experience. Even if it takes longer, you're getting to really enjoy the trip rather than just feel like you're crammed into a box with hundreds of other people and you can't get up and move and look around and things. Exactly. And it's like, it's an experience that 
Well, it's levity. And so I'd imagine it would be also a better experience for people with mobility issues who right now maybe have to be carried in on a, you know, a specific type of chair and they can't move from their seat on a plane. And, and this would maybe allow for reaching that audience of folks who want to be able to travel more places, um, but can't necessarily do so on conventional airlines as easily. Well, you know, it, it's a matter of how you design your landing systems and your uh, entry and exit points for the uh, gondola. But, uh, you know, an airship, uh, you know, you typically think of its entry point in the past as having a gangway, if you will, or uh, somebody that might have uh, mobility issues. This would be something that they would be able to handle relatively easy. Now, there's that one moment everyone talks about how uh, the Empire State Building was built to have a gangway on it for airships to dock with it. That was just simply the realtor's, uh, how do you say, exuberance uh, in promoting the uh, the Empire State Building. You know, that was never going to happen. I mean, uh, it's like, how do you put a gangway out into the middle of the, the streets below so you can reach the gondola? But uh, in any case, that's not the issue with airships today. And, uh, and people with mobility issues can be accommodated in a fashion that is similar to the way they do airplanes uh, uh, today as well. And so I would think that that's where they would start in the design and the construction of uh, their systems to be expansive to include that diversity in our uh, population. Yeah, it seems like a great opportunity to be thinking about these things now while it's kind of experiencing this resurgence and, and there's some flexibility in how we build the systems and everything. So um, so what do you think, you know, is the future of, of air travel for airships? I mean, do you, do you foresee this becoming more prevalent in the near future and maybe have an idea of the timeline like i'm sure there's a lot of governmental bureaucracy that has to <laughs> be be gone through but our, our goal with the race is we wish to have this race uh the world sky race in 26 27 and with that another race uh in 29 and the first instance is basically showcasing the development of airship technology as it is today. And right now, the way I would describe where we are at in watching the technology development is like we're surfers. We're in the middle of the ocean and we see the waves coming in and we see a big wave coming in that we're going to catch. And as so, we're going to see this propel the technology of airships forward. And we're looking at right now a lot of development that is at the entrepreneurial, at the inventive, and at the individual level. And so with the expectation of our prize, we're going to, in essence, accelerate that development. Because when we talk about the prize, we're talking about the power of prizes. And so the most recent prize that we are all in tuned with is the X Prize. The X Prize was basically a technology prize for commercial spaceflight, not governmental spaceflight, but commercial spaceflight. And that $10 million prize inspired 27 companies to spend a total of $121 million for research and development to develop a solution to, in essence, win that $10 million prize. As a result of that, combined investment. We now have a trillion dollar space industry. Now, we will go back to, you know, the uh, prize that pro probably propelled airplane travel and airplane tourism and airplane commerce more than any other. And that was the Ortega Prize, which was $25,000. That prize was eventually won by Lucky Lindy, Lucky Lindbergh. And, um, People paid with their lives and their effort to win that prize. And so that prize, as a result of Lucky Lindbergh's flight from New York to Paris, ushered in the world of Pan-American aviation. 
terminals, airline routes, scheduled services, all the elements of the world in which we now live today is the result of that $25,000 prize being the catalyst, the incubator for who we are and what we do today. But let's take it even further back because, you know, the power of prizes is proven. That being the Longitude Prize of 1719, when Parliament, after watching the British Navy lose two of their ships belonging to her, you know, the, you know, the Royal Navy, they wanted to solve the issue of longitude. I mean, latitude has always been an easy equation for any mariner. I mean, it's a triangle looking at the sun, and you can figure out where you are anywhere between the North Pole and the South Pole. And that is a constancy. Whereas with the rotation of our planet, our constant daily motion, you never knew where you were on that east-west axis in terms of, uh, you know, basically a position on the planet. And so when the Longitude Prize was announced, they figured uh, astronomers would come out with better calculations on all the constellations and they would be dependent in essence on the night. But what happened was out of the box thinking in which a man, Mr. Harrison, came up with two synchronized clocks, one in, you know, having a clock that has identifiably the same time on a ship, knowing it's also at the same time stationary in a place on the planet, you could do the calculus and figure out rotation. And so with that uh, element of calculus and that element of technology, the United Kingdom became the ascendant commercial, maritime, military power for centuries. So the power of prizes in moving us forward is phenomenal. And we are going to make our investment in inventors and inspire them to make the technology that we need for this century. Well, very inspiring goal, and, and I'm excited to see, uh, you know, what happens next. Um, would you say that that's the main uh, impediment, I guess, to, you know, the, the industry right now is, is kind of a lack of uh, funding or incentives, or what, what are some, some other, you know, things that maybe some challenges that, that are facing at this point? You know, airships have been a source of inspiration since they were first developed. And they languished after uh, the 1930s, the labor issues. And what we're seeing right now is a universal effort from Argentina, Brazil, China, Russia, Israel, Germany, United Kingdom, the United States, in the development of the new technology necessary for airship operations. And, and so there's a lot of individuals out there and a few companies out there that are specifically dedicated to this particular proposition. We do not know, and this is where I'm going to be agnostic, we do not know which one is going to produce the best technology that is necessary for this to get beyond just simply a good talking point, but something that what we do. And so our goal with the prize is to be absolutely agnostic as to the technology other than taking away the fossil fuel. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to see solutions that come at us from a diversity of uh, creators. And so it is our goal that at the conclusion of our race, that the world will have not just simply a talking point, but proven, demonstrated, and effective airships. And so what we're looking at doing is taking the power of obvious, and that is the obviousness of airships, the obviousness that we need a green path to go forward, and that we all are looking for solutions to basically living a sustainable life on this planet. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great way to look at it. Um, 
Well, I know we are coming up on time. Uh, I did just want to circle back and talk a little bit about the environmental benefits and impacts of airships. So I know you said that obviously they are much cleaner as far as fuel goes, but um, you know, what is the impact of, I guess, mining or obtaining the, f the fuel that is used, the hydrogen, the helium, because obviously that has to come from somewhere. And, you know, are these renewable resources or are these things that can be produced in a lab? Like, how do you, how do, how do we, I guess, um, obtain them sustainably in a way that isn't going to cause other issues, you know, in other parts of the environment? Well, as yesterday, I attended uh, here in Houston, the Helium Super Summit, which is a conference dedicated to the acquisition, development, distribution of helium and the technology therein, the economic models for it. And one of the observations that I come away with from attending that conference is that as we provide a reason for airships to use helium, the investment that is necessary in the gas producing industry will actually materialize in a far, far more effective fashion in that this is what happens every day. We produce helium and it's found in virtually all natural gas around the world. What happens is the eons of uh, being in the ground is where natural gas is exposed to the radioactivity of our inner core of our planet results in creation of helium. And so the only places that we find helium on our planet is in natural gas. We can't manufacture it because helium is one of is a noble element that will not combine with anything. So there's nothing that we can extract it from. So we have to find it in its natural state, which is in natural gas. And what happens in the day's world is we do not bother to capture that helium. So 99 plus a large percent of that remaining 1% of the helium that's produced every day, every second of every day escapes. And so there's two instances for, the, for helium on our planet. And that is you either use it and lose it or you lose it. And the reason I say that is that our gravity is not strong enough to keep helium in our atmosphere. The moment it escapes that party balloon, it's on its way to commingle with the rest of the helium in the universe. It's going to race past our space station as it does that. And so when helium escapes the ground from natural produ uh, gas production, it's because we did not bother to keep it and we did not bother to capture it. Now, what we're doing is we're providing an incentive for the modernization of natural gas production on a global basis, which will have profound environmental impacts beyond just simply capturing helium. So this is an exciting part of the conversation is how we stimulate the change in the way industry approaches the conservation of that particular element. And so helium, uh, from what I understand, is a better fuel to use um, than like hydrogen because it's not as flammable. Is that correct? Or it's Helium safer? is completely unflammable. Yeah. And, you know, helium, it's a noble element. It's a noble element because it does not combine with anything. Mm -hmm. And so it can't combust. It cannot create another molecule. And uh, it is a, it's a atom in perfect balance with two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. And so it's not going to do anything except go and commingle with the rest of the helium that was created when we had mm -hmm. the Big Bang. So it's and the so, preferred fuel to use for this kind of travel because for, for all those reasons. And, and, and I'm not going to use the word fuel. I'm going to use the or, word buoyancy, uh, the, the uplifting gas that makes this possible. Now, hydrogen, it has a little more lift because it's a little lighter, but hydrogen, we know hydrogen is uh, able to combine with anything. I mean, first of all, what's water, mm -hmm. if not part hydrogen? And so hydrogen readily 
is an item that can combust, it can react, it has that chemical reaction, and those can be adverse to what our purposes may be. Okay. So is it possible to extract helium without, I guess, burning uh, natural gas or does does that make sense? You know, I mean, do you it's have so to much burn release one to get the other or can you keep the natural gas from going into the atmosphere to get the helium? Uh, basically, helium production is means you're sequestering helium out of a mixture of uh, natural gases. And that mixture is going to be a variety of gases. And in order to capture helium, one typically has to capture all the others. And what that means is there is a significant issue that we all have in terms of natural gas production where methane escapes into our atmosphere. And methane is very, very damaging to our environment. And again, that's one of those elements where if we modernize natural gas production to capture helium, by default, we already capture the methane and other elements as well. So what we're talking about is, in essence, looking at an industry that needs modernizing. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I was, I guess, getting at is that the methane, if that it gets into the atmosphere, then that's kind of still releasing a greenhouse gas that we don't want. So, um, yeah, it's it sounds like a win-win if we can keep the helium for use, like you said, not just lose it, L lose it on the way to something good, I guess. <laughs> exactly. It's like, so. you know, when that he you know, when when the helium is captured and it's not immediately taken out of that natural gas, it still stays in the mixture of natural gas. So when you make your coffee in the morning or your tea in the morning, you turn on the burner uh, on the stove. Well, basically, a little bit of helium is in there and it's on its way past the space station and the moon as well. So there's that element in which it's there, but we have not bothered to use it before we lose it. Okay. Um, so for folks who want to learn more about what you guys are doing, about the industry, about, you know, airships, helium, anything, um, what are some resources you would share with them to delve in down this rabbit hole? <laughs> well, yeah, there's a, there's a great book about the history. Uh, and if you're a historian, I mean, in, or love aviation, Empires of the Sky, and that is about truly the competition between the Zeppelin Company and Pan American Aviation of the 1920s. It's a good read, and it's also what I describe as gives you a sense of the technology development, the challenges that they encountered, and what they overcame, and what they were able to achieve. So I would recommend that. Um, the other is, you know, these days, all you have to do is Google things like Google. In other words, Sergey Brin, he's about to hatch his airship coming out of his hangar. So when I said that there's individuals out there that are part of the change in the scenery of airships today, they are there. We have organizations like the Flying Wells out of France, which is looking at developing advanced cargo movement utilizing airships. And so uh, there's a variety of sources that I would just simply say Google Flying Wells, Google Hybrid Air Vehicles, Google Sergey Brin, and at the same time, Google us. We're called the theworldskyrace.com. And our goal is, as I've described, is to be an incubator for these technologies. We're going to be agnostic as to who's the best. We want them to prove that to us. And is, is there a way for people to get involved with what you're doing if they want to help promote or organize or, you know, just like you, I know you mentioned earlier, teachers can get lesson plans. Like how, how can folks be a part of this? Well, we have on our website the means to uh, be a part of our newsletter, which is sporadic. But on the other hand, it's coming out more and more often. The other is uh, basically... Uh, staying in tune with the developments that we're working on that are designed to showcase the technology of airships. And so uh, just put us into your news feed and uh, you'll see us uh, make our advances. And at the same time, we are looking at educators 
education and the institutions to be our resource partners. And we're looking at the formation of those uh, partnerships. Another facet of connecting the dots. Great. So if folks are in that field, they can reach out to you and through the website, I guess, or social media and yeah, be a part of that. I would say I would say that. And so world sky race, and I say it like this, world like in the globe, sky like the air, race like a very fierce competition, worldskyrace.com. Awesome. Well, uh, this has been a great conversation. Is there anything we haven't covered about this topic that you would want to throw in last minute? Oh, it's a peripatetic conversation. You know, it's <laughs> like, I'll think of that afterwards. Right. <laughs> there's, there's never enough time probably to cover everything, but um, hopefully this is a good start for folks who haven't heard of or thought about airships and as, as a, you know, way to transition to more sustainable air travel. Um, and yeah, so I guess we'll move on now to our green life hacks, which is where we share one thing that people can do to live more sustainably and reduce their own carbon footprint in their life. Um, so Don, would you like to start us off? Sure. I, I, I practice this, no straws. And I've eliminated the use of straws from my life. And I make certain that whenever somebody hands me a drink, that I hand that straw back to them and say, please, don't hand these out. I mean, you know, when you think of the need for a straw, it might be for a medical purpose. I can appreciate that. But beyond that, it's more convenience. And what it does is it seriously leaves a plastic debris that is not going to be of any use to anyone because no one wants to use somebody else's straw. Yes, very true. And I... I was very pleased to find when I moved to Europe that um, plastic straws are actually not very common. It's more paper, if anything, so if they give you one. So um, hope, hopefully the U.S. and the rest of the world will catch up to, <laughs> to that as well. Um, and so my green life hack this month, um, I think it's been mentioned on a previous episode, but I'm going to repeat it uh, because it's been a while and because I've actually been using it myself recently, whereas at the time it wasn't available near me, um, is, is a couple of apps, um, one called Too Good To Go, which is basically where you can <clears throat> sign up and get notifications for local businesses, be they grocery stores or restaurants that uh, participate and will sell food at the end of their day or their shift that is about to go off maybe, or that they would just throw away and they sell it for like a third or a fourth of the price. So it's a great way to get food for cheap and save it from the landfill. And I probably use it way too much in my own life, but um, I've gotten lots and lots of produce from it, fresh produce, as well as baked goods and meals. You can find just about anything. So if you're in an area where that's uh, offered, Too Good To Go is the app. Um, the other one is Olio, O-L-I-O, -O, and again, that may not be available everywhere, but it's where people can give things away for free. They can also post to sell, but um, usually when I get too much of the produce uh, for myself, I'll post what's left on there and give it away to someone else. So, um, And I've gotten lots of food that way, too. So both very good apps to help reduce waste, save you money, and connect you to your community. So. Uh, Don, again, thank you so much for being on. And one last time, will you share with our listeners where they can find you and any organization you want to plug online? All right. Well, I'm going to plug our organization, the World Air League, and the way to find us is worldskyrace.com. And uh, essentially, it is a focal point for who we are and what we're doing and uh, our goal setting. And with that, we would welcome this to be, be the beginning of a conversation that starts a social media. Perhaps um, as we put it together, uh, we're going to want to raise the totality of the prizes for the World Sky Race. So we certainly welcome involvement and discussion on how you can become involved. So reach out to us at worldskyrace.com. And I'm going to simply say the best email for us is cworldskyrace.com, S-E-E. -E. We're all going to look up and see it. Great. 
All right, and we'll link to this and every other uh, resource in the show notes in case you missed it or you, you don't have time to, to jot that down. Um, and you can find the show itself on any platform just about that you listen to podcasts, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find me personally at Het's Gonna Be Me on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, again, Don, thanks for being on and uh, excited to see what you guys do next. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to say uh, at World Sky Race as far as social media is concerned as well. So Perfect. Uh, there's <laughs> that means and since I am, how do you say, a bit of a Luddite in that area, that's one of those <laughs> things I don't think of right off the top of my head. But I do know it's a part. We have that as a part of us. Okay. Perfect. And we'll link to All that right. as well. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks again.